so many different authors of the continental and also analytical, I think, tradition. James is honorary professor of philosophy at Deakin University in Australia. And we are especially interested in uh, William's use of pragmatism in the reading of many crucial contemporary issues from metaphysics to politics, from the theory of immanence uh, to the theme of process in philosophy. His brilliant and insightful interpretation of so many texts by Deleuze inspired us. Here I, I want to quote just a few of them. Gilles Deleuze, Difference and Repetition, a Critical Introduction and Guide. Gilles Deleuze, Logic of Sense, a Critical Introduction and Guide. Gilles Deleuze, a Philosophy of Time. And the last one, the last expression of his very philosophy, a process, process of philosophy of science, and the latest one, the egalitarian sublime. Thank you for being here with us today. The title of the lecture, uh, as, you, as you saw, is definitely attractive and unconventional. That is a fantastic pragmatism. Please feel free to start, James. Well, thank you very much for the invitation, uh, Jose. I was delighted to be able to speak to your group. I'm speaking from a very snowy Edinburgh, so maybe in contrast to Brazil, without a doubt, and many other places in the world. So I chose fantastic pragmatism as my title as a way to bring together two different directions um, that come from my research. Uh, the first comes out of work in the post-structuralist tradition, but also analytic tradition in relation to the history of philosophy. And I wanted to think what kind of pragmatism comes out of thinkers such as Deleuze and Guattari, um, but also Lyotard and perhaps uh, for this paper, uh, Derrida as well, and the influence of, uh, in particular, Derrida's work on uh, metaphysics. So that's one direction. It's an historical sense of uh, where does pragmatism go now? The second direction is in relation to uh, the first part of the, the title of this whole series of papers, and that's a uh, method of thinking. Uh, as I've been working on um, a process philosophy, uh, in particular a process philosophy of signs, and then a process account and a value and anarchistic account uh, of the sublime, uh, I've felt compelled, I've had to develop um, a certain kind of pragmatism within them. Uh, so pragmatism became a necessary moment in thinking about signs and thinking about the sublime. So there's these two influences. There's uh, an historical movement. What does it mean for pragmatism to come after Deleuze, Lyotard, Derrida, but also uh, their relation to uh, the analytic tradition and to the tradition of uh, process philosophy? As everyone uh, listening will know, those two work quite closely together. So uh, James uh, is very influential within process philosophy. Um, there's a, a sense of a certain kind of pragmatism uh, within many process philosophers. Um, so, so there's that, that coming together of, of two strains. And I wanted to draw a distinction that's best thought of as a distinction in terms of degrees. Sometimes when we think of something like pragmatism, we can think about the pragmatism that I do and the pragmatism that I don't want to do. Good pragmatism, bad pragmatism, these kinds of distinctions. I don't want to do that. Um, the whole point about process philosophy is there's a certain kind of connection of everything within process. That means that whenever we try to make distinctions, judge between different versions, think of things 
differently. We can't draw absolute distinctions. There is no absolute within connected processes. So when I talk about fantastic pragmatism, I'm advocating a certain degree of a certain kind of pragmatism, doing it more like this and less like that, rather than saying there's one way and that's the way and the other ways are wrong. That's not what I'm talking about. So the first claim that I want to start to develop in answering this question, what is the pragmatism that I'm moving to supposed to be? What is the one that I want the highest degree for, the greatest intensity around? And that is pragmatism as fantastic. Obviously that's a play on words. Fantastic can mean outstanding, but it can also mean fantastic in the sense of fantasy, of invention. That's what I'm arguing for, is a pragmatism that's fanciful. Now, I chose it quite deliberately uh, to provoke. We can think of pragmatism as that which is as far from the fanciful as you can get in many different ways. Pragmatism is thought of in opposition to idealism, it's thought of in opposition to being overly abstract. It's thought of as something that moves towards pragma, matter, the matter at hand, being pragmatic, almost like being um, an engineer, someone involved in a situation. Well, what could be further than that than people who are fanciful? Dreamers. The whole point that I want to argue for is that pragmatism should move more towards the fanciful and the inventive and away from a close immersion in very practical questions and challenges. A first clue to the kind of answer that I'm giving and why I'm giving this answer is a distinction between philosophers and other people. I'm a philosopher um, obsessive. Um, what's special about philosophers? And what is special about philosophers in relation to pragmatism? And to give you a sense of where this argument is going, the thing that's special about philosophers comes from my reading of Deleuze and many other people's readings of, of Deleuze. It's that the kind of problem that philosophers are interacting with is different from the kind of problem we think of in relation to, for instance, a particular kind of technical difficulty or a problem in terms of engineering, how to put a bridge across a, a river. Anything that allows an answer isn't a philosophical problem. A philosophical problem is something that can't be answered once and for all. It can't even be answered satisfactorily in a local sense. Why? Because a philosophical problem goes all the way back in time and all the way to the future it brings together the whole connectedness of a world in a, what I would call like a spider's web of difficulty. So Nietzsche liked the, the metaphor of the, of the web and many other philosophers have used it, but anybody who's dealt with a web or a net knows that when you pull one thread, you pull all of them and everything is pulled in one direction or another. So you can't have a final solution to how you deal with something connected like a web. What you do is rearrange it. You have a new pattern and that pattern handles some things better and some things worse and moves things on. That's what a philosophical problem is like. And that's why pragmatism must be 
fanciful. Now, a way of understanding that can be got from a, another paper or blog post that I gave, and that dates back to when I was asked to, well, define pragmatism. And pragmatism, as far as I can see, viewed in its very broad sense, tries to respond to the principle that everything evolves amidst a shared problem. That is, there is nothing that isn't in a process of change. There's nothing that as soon as you move towards it, isn't moving away from you, isn't readapting, isn't changing to move in a new direction, incorporate new elements, shape shifting and so on. So everything evolves. That's the need for pragmatism. We could think that pragmatism is necessary because we have practical problems and we need to be practical about them. Right? That would be a very general definition of why we needed pragmatism. But that's not to understand, in my view, pragmatism at all. Pragmatism is needed because underlying everything is a constant evanescence, a constant disappearing and reappearing of the world. And it's exactly because of that that we need to be pragmatic in the sense of constantly readapting, reinventing, recreation, recreating. The other aspect that's radical, extreme about pragmatism is the notion that this involves everything. Nothing stands independent of a process of evolution. So there are no absolute values. There are no absolute forms. There are no absolute ideas. There is nothing independent, abstract, and eternal. Everything evolves amidst, in the middle of, a shared problem. This is another aspect of pragmatism, according to the reading that I'm giving is that pragmatism isn't a lonely endeavor because everything is connected and everything's changing. Whenever we encounter a problem and evolution, we do so with others, necessarily with others. So a problem is always shared and it's shared in a deep sense. We could think of uh, sharing a problem in the sense of, again, um, a designer designing a new sign or advert, say. Now, the designer might think that the advert is being designed by the designer, but then going to be received by whoever reads the advert, who reads the sign. The pragmatist knows that whatever the pragmatist does changes the world for everyone else. So it's a deep sense of shared problem. It's a shared problem, again, as if we were all on a spider's web. And if I move too sharply on the web, I call the spider to everyone around me. So it's a, um, a joint challenge each time that pragmatism is facing up to. And a little bit later in the talk, I will show how that then leads into the necessity of democracy for pragmatism. This isn't a new idea at all uh, and has been repeated throughout the 20th century and is still important now. Now I'll stop for a minute. I'm very aware that I'm the kind of English person who speaks very quickly. Am I speaking too quickly? It's fine, okay. Uh, no, I don't think I I can follow well because <laughs> I'm sure you can. <laughs> no, I, I mean the English pronunciation is better for us than the American one. So okay. I, I think it's clear enough. But uh, if if someone wants you you go lower. Yeah, if if that's the case, you can always ask me to okay. uh, make things clear at the end. Okay, what, what do 
the students think Laura Misurakas is okay for you or Ricardo Lameri? Okay, I think oh. it's, it's okay. I'll continue then. So when I say creativity in relation to pragmatism, what kind of creativity do I mean? Well, I've put it uh, in the uh, paper that I sent out that pragmatism must construct new realities. What, what do I mean by that? I mean that the kind of philosophical pragmatism that I'm talking about is involved in a construction between philosophical speculation, so the invention of philosophical hypo hypotheses, systems, structures, and concepts, between that and worlds. So it's an anchored pragmatism. It's a pragmatism that's anchored to worlds. And note that I put worlds in plural. It's always a question of multiplicities of worlds that we're interacting with. So there's a moment of speculation in this construction. For instance, the speculation that the world is process or the speculation that the sublime is anarchic or the speculation that um, the worlds are multiple and a check against the world, what we might call experience or evidence. Now, when I say world, this brings out a very important aspect of the notion of problem. I've already mentioned it. It's that when a pragmatist interacts with a world, the pragmatist is interacting with a world in terms of its past, its present, and its future. So it's a speculative interaction with how the world has been and what we can learn from that. How the world is, that is the experience in terms of evidence around us in the, in the world. And how the world will be its future. Traditionally, we think of time in terms of the past being past, the present being now, and the future being at some point about to happen. That's not the sense of world and time that the pragmatist is working with. The pragmatist works with the way in which past, present, and future are brought together and interact in any philosophical speculation. So the invention of a philosophical concept, such as mind or distinction between mind and body, is a calling of the future into the present, a transformation of the present, and a learning and transformation of the past. So any intervention is an intervention across the whole of the world. And pragmatism is a between in terms of speculation and worlds understood in that timely way. That's the positive side of it. It can also be put negatively. Now I'm wary about negative definitions, uh, there's a certain kind of um, negativity and resentment about them. Um, they also are unhelpful because uh, they lead to um, rejection, anger, all these kinds of, of senses. However, it's also important to be honest about one's emotions. And uh, I I'm trying to resist a particular way of looking at pragmatism. And the particular way is when pragmatism allies itself to common sense and ordinary experience. And the way I put this is 
that what pragmatism must seek to do is escape the bane, that means the destructiveness, the harmfulness of common sense. Those of you who know Deleuze and, and other thinkers of post-structuralism know that common sense is one of the things that, that, that they're particularly critical of. It's also the case that a tradition that I'm particularly attracted to, uh, let's say around 1950s to 1960s uh, analytic philosophy, often allies itself at times with not so much common sense, but at least ordinary language in the world. Now, I want to maintain both of those and yet reject a certain understanding of common sense, and that's going to come out through the paper. So pragmatism must not seek solely to attune to common truths or ordinary experience, is what I mean by escaping the bane of common sense. So not attune, not seek to be in touch with common truths. It should be seeking exactly the opposite. It should be always seeking to challenge them and move out of those common truths. And the same is true for ordinary experience. Any notion of common categories and values of a shared direction. So let's look at a little bit more deeply into what this means and move into a concept that I haven't mentioned up to now, and I think it's very important, and that's the concept of metaphysics. When a philosophy is being creative in the sense of bridging between speculation and worlds in relation to shared problems, what is that pragmatism? What is that philosophy trying to do? It's trying to do metaphysics. That is the creation of a certain image of the world in relation or up against that world as a first definition of metaphysics. So here's the conceptual and more philosophical version of the negative that I'm trying to express. To avoid the destructiveness of latent metaphysics. So part of the argument is that there's a certain way of doing pragmatism, a certain way of doing philosophy that is destructive in a way that we can perhaps avoid by doing it in another way. And the destructiveness that I'm concerned about is latent metaphysics. Latent in the sense of hidden, underlying, but also latent in the sense of um, cartoons. Uh, we all know the old cartoon and comedy jokes of a, um, a, a pot of paint uh, that's left by um, Laurel or Hardy on the floor and Laurel or Hardy will then go and tread in it five minutes later. Well, that's a latent pot of paint. It's waiting for a disaster to happen later. Part of my concern is that uh, metaphysics isn't necessarily in the moment, isn't necessarily expressed in the here and now, isn't even necessarily labeled philosophical metaphysics. It's there nonetheless in what we do in common actions, in ordinary language. And the, when it's waiting in that way, when it's latent, it's particularly destructive in the sense of destructive in a particular way. The argument is that a constructive and creative pragmatism can avoid that latency. How? One, by being critical of all metaphysical constructions. So it's a notion of being thorough in analyzing and criticizing the metaphysical constructions that one's involved in, including one's own. Pragmatism historically has been exceptionally good as a philosophy in doing that. Uh, for instance, uh, the um, critique 
of Cartesian dualism that runs all the way through early pragmatism, uh, or the critique of idealism and contemporary idealism that one finds uh, around uh, James and beyond. Uh, so that kind of critique is, is important, but I want to extend it or draw it out in relation to pragmatism itself. That pragmatism might have latent metaphysics within it if it goes too much towards the common and the ordinary. So what I'm arguing for, and this is very much in line uh, with uh, earlier work um, that one finds in particular in Deleuze, and that's a perpetual constructiveness and critique. It's not something that happens for a moment and then passes. It's not something that can pass a given hurdle and we say, oh, what we've done with dualism or we've uh, done with um, abstract metaphysics. We can't do that. It's a perpetual ongoing task. It's um, like the myth of Sisyphus as told by Camus. Um, pragmatists are, are constantly rolling that rock up the hill, it's rolling back down, they have to do it again and again. And that's true of critique. Why? Because the problem is constantly evolving as well. So whatever problem we are working with or interacting with, we are having to reassess and rework in a thorough way. So for instance, uh, we could think, uh, and some forms of science work this way, that um, questions and problems from the past are in the past, they're gone. So there was the problem of, of uh, let's say, um, how to model the movement of steam through a particular kind of engine. But once you've modeled that and that's solved, then there's new questions. In philosophy and philosophical pragmatism, that's not the same, it's not the same. The new questions are also interacting with those from the past and going back to them. And we can see that in the practices of philosophy, uh, the, the pragmatics of philosophy as a kind of writing, in particular, uh, looking at uh, Derrida, Deleuze, Heidegger, Nietzsche, many uh, analytic philosophers, uh, there's a constant going back to the past and to past thoughts and reworking them, rewriting them, reinterpreting them. And that means that the, the pragmatism is one that's not only perpetual construction moving forward, but it's a perpetual construction of, of uh, its own past. We're, we're changing not who we're going to be, not who we are, but we're changing who we were as well. So let's go a bit uh, deeper into this. And now I'm going to work a bit closer to the text so uh, that you, some of you might have uh, in front of you. So here are a set of statements uh, that are more simplified versions, they're glosses of my uh, main claims. And I'm going to go into them in greater depth as uh, I uh, work through. Now, uh, why are metaphysics latent is the question that I'm interacting with now. Why are metaphysics latent? Well, firstly, every proposition and logic has metaphysical presuppositions, everyone. There, there is no proposition, there is no logic that doesn't have metaphysical presuppositions in the strong sense of being creative and constructive about worlds in ways that are necessarily speculative and in some sense hypothetical, right? That's the first sense. The second sense is in occurring in a multiplicity. There isn't an obvious or natural or essential or straightforward or 
ordinary proposition or logic. Even that claim is already engaging us in a kind of a metaphysics. There's a good way of testing this, and it's a way that it isn't done that often. Uh, and it's simply to take a given claim, a given proposition, and taking it back or out to another period in history. Now, it might be that being pragmatic um, now involves a certain set of acts, values, um, engagements, and so on. If you carry those same acts, values, engagements um, back 50 years or back 100 years, all of a sudden, their immediacy, their common sense aspect, their ordinary experience aspects completely disappear and shift. It can be experienced well in relation to that in terms of uh, the way in which novelists and great historical novelists do this. You have pragmatic characters. Uh, I've been reading with great pleasure the um, issue uh, in the European Journal of Pragmatism that you, Rossella, have, have a, an article in, um, and their discussions of uh, Umberto Eco in it. Now, what, what Eco shows us is indeed, as some of the articles argue, uh, is that a pragmatist in the name of the rose. There's a, a method of abduction is one of the uh, paper's arguments. In fact, two of the papers argue uh, that there's a method of abduction. But the ingredients of that pragmatism and of that abduction are very, very different. The ingredients are uh, certain kinds of religion, certain kinds of um, uh, practices within monasteries and interactions and so on. And the same is true for um, uh, historical um, investigations in relation to historical texts, for instance. Uh, I'm particularly interested in, in uh, pragmatism as a method for historians here, and I uh, have, have a, a paper that uh, discusses this. So every proposition and logic has metaphysical presuppositions. We can pull that out by displacing them, by taking them out of their moment and putting them in another moment. Right? Now, these are latent when they're either denied or hidden. It's um, a frequently encountered moment in philosophy and philosophical argument uh, where the argument at some point says, what I am describing in another philosopher, I now can escape. I no longer have that problem. Right? So, uh, for instance, the vice of metaphysics is something that we can escape. That kind of argument is one that is often in danger of having a, a hidden uh, aspect uh, to it. A, a good way, uh, a good encounter of that is, for instance, in the way that uh, Nietzsche shows the hidden forms of idealism or the uh, hidden forms of religiosity in um, philosophies that quite explicitly claim uh, not to be idealist or not to be uh, religious in their uh, aspects. So uh, the, the quote that I uh, show you in that uh, paragraph is um, a very famous one uh, from uh, Reed. Um, uh, common sense is where we appeal to the plain man within our breast, to the plain man uh, within our breast, within our heart, or to bare facts, or to natural reason or logic, or when systems claim to be metaphysical in one way, but turn out to be metaphysical in another. Now, you, you'll see that uh, in this argument, uh, there's one thing that I'm introducing that isn't very controversial, certain kinds of proposition, for instance, um, have metaphysical presuppositions. But the notion that a logic has metaphysical presuppositions is much more controversial. And it's also much more problematic for pragmatism because certain contemporary branches of pragmatism 
and also historical ones, in particular going back to Peirce, um, would want to say that they escape the metaphysical presuppositions, for instance, of certain sets of propositions because of their logic. Now, if the logic is itself metaphysical, that kind of move isn't possible. Now, I haven't I didn't in this particular argument um, set it out, but the, the contemporary argument and analysis uh, that I'm thinking of in relation to this is uh, by Cheryl Mysack, and in particular, uh, in terms of her wonderful new book on Frank Ramsey. Now, uh, Mysack's argument um, wants to maintain a particular relation to truth for pragmatism. And that relation to truth is guaranteed partly by a, uh, an allegiance to uh, a particular logic and a um, commitment to a certain kind of correspondence theory of truth. Now, I'm putting forward the perhaps more controversial uh, claim that that kind of move is not legitimate if it thinks that it escapes metaphysical presuppositions in its logic or in its theory of correspondence. Right? Now, in relation to read, our modernity um, obviously has always be suspicious of a philosopher who says, obviously, that's exactly what I'm trying to argue against, and I've just done it myself. So um, it, it can be shown through a whole set of tools that we have uh, in, in terms of philosophical analysis uh, within all the different contemporary traditions. And it comes out in these kinds of questions against Reed, um, the Scottish Enlightenment thinker. Um, which plain man within our breast? So there's always already a question of um, universal man and the uh, gendering of uh, the man of common sense. What are the effects of projecting this man on others? So the notion that the inside uh, man is the same as others. So there's the whole Wittgensteinian problem of pain, for instance, here. How and why does this man evolve over time? The plain man within Reed's breast is very, very different from the plain man within ours. Um, unfortunately, we're going through almost an experiment of that kind of change over time in what's happened to us. Uh, and we find it in the phrases that we use when we say, oh, well, that was pre and that's post COVID. How is there, what would it mean to refer to common sense or ordinary experience when we have these shifts that we want to express as important and relevant to the problems of our time when we need to use terms such as pre and post COVID? The, what stands as ordinary experience is exceptionally different to us now. Now we can move this uh, to a slightly more abstract sense. So is this plain man the same in different locations? So a question of relativism here in terms of spatial geographic uh, uh, peoples uh, question and at different ages. So at different moments of the evolution of ourselves. Uh, I know that the plain person within me is extremely different to the plain person that was within me when I was 16. What is the effect of language and the language we use according to this internal aspect? What's the effect of education? When we speak of ordinary experience and experience, what about the varieties of experience a life undergoes over days, months and years? For instance, should we include dreams? Should we include the unconscious in relation to experience? Uh, the, the, the 
book uh, reference to um, Frank Ramsey's by Cheryl Misak, uh, M-I-S-A-K, and it came out uh, two, three years ago. Um, and it's um, a combination of uh, an account of Ramsey's uh, life um, and uh, Ramsey's uh, uh, philosophy. So, um, uh, and it's simply called Frank Ramsey, um, Oxford University Press. Um, I, I recommend it very very highly it's a, a a wonderful book uh does that answer the question someone asked me asked me that question so so that that's the book that i'm talking about now um i i can recommend a talk by cheryl mysack that you can uh find uh, cheryl 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 uh Mysack, um that you can find um simply by searching online it's a talk that she gives uh talking about Cambridge pragmatism. So if you if you search for her talk on um, Frank Ramsey, Cambridge pragmatism, it's a talk that is a, uh, a very good description and argument of her point about Ramsey and truth. Uh, uh, now, um, in a very modest way, I'm trying to hear uh, put some arguments uh, that distance my view from the view that MySAC is is setting out uh, at much greater length and 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 depth. It also might be interesting for for those of you who are working on Perth because this talk on on Ramsey and truth and Cambridge pragmatism also has a very good discussion on Perth. So there you go. Uh, that's a, a strong recommendation. I can't hear you. Rosella, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry, maybe, maybe uh, it was the talk uh, she gave uh, at the International Congress on Perth in 1914, because I remember something like that. Maybe. Yes, I think it is 2013. At, 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 I think it's in Cambridge. Um, okay. Uh, the talk. In any case, uh, thank you. Yeah, um, it's the one also where Hugh Price is there and so on. Um, uh, and uh, yes, it's, a, it's an excellent talk. Well, in my view, it's an excellent talk. Mm -hmm. um, now, um, moving um, a, bit, a bit further on in terms of um, claims. Um, I want to claim that all metaphysics have been destru destructive. And now, now why? Uh, it's because any metaphysics, any um, speculative engagement with the world uh, also has a moment of overlooking. It, it necessarily misses, eludes, misrepresents the worlds that they construct, describe, and explain. Now, this is important in terms of understanding why pragmatism has such an important role to play. Pragmatism as I have, as I have defined it in, in this hinge or transition moment between worlds and speculative metaphysics. It's because Pragmatism is exceptionally good at tracing these misrepresentations, these misdescriptions. And, and this is where traditional um, uh, pragmatism, in its commitment to experience, has a crucial role to play. Um, it, it has um, very strong tools for looking at a world and relating those aspects of the world that have been distorted and that have been mismanaged uh, by a particular metaphysical uh, position. Um, uh, it, clearly, James is e extraordinarily uh, good at that, but Dewey is uh, as well. 
um, in terms of historical positions within uh, pragmatism. Um, Dewey, uh, whose education uh, I'm particularly interested in, uh, is uh, one of the first thinkers to have uh, awoken us to um, that which is missed in the young learner, in the, in the pupil. And, and his pragmatism uh, and educational pragmatism exactly showed how a particular system of education was mismatched to the uh, pupils and experiences and social worlds that it was interacting with. And this is the, the, the role of pragmatism in relation to, to metaphysics that I want to draw out, or one of them. So there are famous versions of this misrepresentation and subsequent violence. So any misrepresentation is, is a violence, we, uh, I want to claim. Uh, includes kinds of dualism, uh, where a lower tier of existence is judged in relation to a higher one. So um, the uh, contemporary return to animals uh, as uh, philosophically important, but also important in terms of uh, values and care um, is um, important uh, or drawn out uh, in term once there is a, an analysis of its roots, for instance, in terms of definitions of reason or kinds of dualism, uh, specifically Cartesian dualism, for instance, where animals are defined as mechanisms. But there are other kinds of, of violence, for instance, when necessity is posited against a world of probabilities. So uh, again, uh, all kinds of materialism where mechanical processes are imposed on living ones. These are all cases where the pragmatism has uh, worked on. Uh, but I want to push that a bit further and say that kinds of adherence to the law of non-contradiction, for instance, can involve forms of metaphysical violence. Um, so if you adhere to the law of non-contradiction, you're not prepared to entertain dialethia. Um, but now uh, there are many cases politically, for instance, and legally, where we might want to maintain dialethia, where we want to say uh, that something is both P and not P, both this and its opposite. Um, so the first three reasons have long been canonical reasons to support pragmatism, I say, but the, the fourth is more controversial, but I think more important uh, at the moment. I'm going to move on. Um, one thing that I uh, wasn't uh, aware of, I normally speak for about an hour. I've been speaking uh, for about um, 50 minutes now, so I'll, I'll continue a little bit uh, longer. I want to move on to um, the uh, work by David MacArthur that I was uh, reading, um, because uh, MacArthur introduces a concept of, of metaphysical quietism that I want to look at. Now, the first thing that I should say is that the, the argument about the insidiousness, the way in which metaphysical violence uh, enters into um, philosophy, uh, I'm not making a moral argument about this violence. That is, uh, the violence is going to be a matter of uh, degrees of something that's necessary. We always are going to make missteps and misrepresentations in philosophical language, right? So it's a matter of how do we pragmatically live with the fact that we are always going to make them. So it's a practical argument, not a moral argument uh, that I'm making. So I'm concerned uh, about subtle and hidden background processes. Uh, and my contention is that these processes are at work in post metaphysical pragmatisms. So earlier on in this talk, I uh, said that I wanted to make distinctions between different kinds of pragmatisms. Uh, I now want to make it a little bit more clear about what kind of pragmatisms I'm concerned about, and it's, it's ones that claim to be post-metaphysical. Um, 
And uh, David MacArthur has uh, picked up on these using a concept that's actually much older than his work and the many other thinkers have used, and it's called metaphysical quietism. And David MacArthur wants to argue for it positively, and he does so in studies of uh, Brandom, Price, and uh, Rorty. Now, I, I can see uh, why he does so in relation to Price and Rorty. I'm a lot less uh, comfortable in doing so in relation to Brandom, in particular in terms of Brandom's uh, long engagement with Hegel. Right. So, so to think of of Brandom as post-metaphysical, given given that particular association, I think is is slightly harder to to push. Now, following on and improving on Rorty's more impressionistic version, so Rorty himself claims uh, to be a metaphysical quietist, to withdraw from metaphysics. Uh, MacArthur defines it uh, in these terms, and I'll, I'll read the quote. Uh, those of you who have the text have it um, in front of you. Now, what I want to, to draw out, uh, and I'll work through the quote in, in detail. So, uh, quietism, he says, at a minimum. Now, uh, let's em emphasize this. What he's given are minimal conditions for quietism. Now, this work on minimal conditions is already a sign of a kind of quietism because the minimal conditions that he's given are for a local and temporary pragmatic practice. Right? So it's of a thinker acting, writing, and interacting in a local area, for instance, a particular question about law, say, or a particular question uh, within um, a definition of truth, and impinging and acting in a way that's local and in the here and now. And this is a sense of pragmatism that I'm opposed to. Why? Because I want to defend the claim that you can never act locally. You'll have all encountered the um, slogan, um, uh, act local and be global, right? You can never act locally. In acting locally, you will also be having repercussions globally, forward and back in time. But this, this use of at a minimum is a sign of a way of thinking that things that, no, you can, you can do philosophy and do pragmatism as if it's like DIY the fence has fallen down, you need to mend the fence. Once you mend the fence, then the wall might wall fall down, you mend that differently and so on and so forth, right? Local, temporary. That's not how philosophy can act. Now it refers to a non-constructive, you can, you can see why I wanted to pick on this quote. It, so it's a non-constructive mode of philosophizing. I don't think that any mode of philosophizing can be non-constructive. Why? Because invariably you are doing that philosophizing over time and through forms of repetition, introducing variations in series. You'll see that there's a Deleuzean aspect to this, but there's also uh, a, uh, a Derridean aspect to this. You, you can never step outside the wider series and texts that you're interacting with. When you interact with them, you are being constructive. So for instance, when teaching a child, you um, correct a form of pronunciation and you say, don't pronounce your S, shh, pronounce it S, not sh, S. If they can't do it, you're already constructing and setting up series of problems, difficulties, 
and behaviors for the future. Uh, we know this from reading Foucault, for instance. Uh, so th the idea that there can be a non-constructive mode of philosophizing, I think is exactly an example of the kind of misrepresentation of the world that I'm arguing against. One, he, uh, McCarthy goes on, that has no ambition to formulate a general philosophical theory. You always have to, nor to provide a straight answer to a philosophical problem. The aim of the quietist, he says, in the region of philosophical thought to which it applies, is not to embrace philosophical doctrines or theories, but to earn the right to live without them. I just don't think that you can earn the right to live without them. And why? My argument is process philosophical and linguistic. It does not express an ought. Philosophy should not claim to be post-metaphysical, but I can't. Philosophy, any language, cannot be post-metaphysical. When we use language, when we place our acts and words into living structures, we impede upon, interact with, support, either take the side of one or the other, increase the degree of something or the degree of something else, and further metaphysical structures. We might not do so consciously, that's not important. So one of the things that underlies a very, let's say, say the sense of quietist post-metaphysical philosophy is the notion that we can do things consciously. We can be consciously a quietist, uh, but that underplays the way in which everything we do is going to be working unconsciously both in terms of its consequences and in terms of its antecedents. So for example, when we use particular pronouns, you'll, you'll notice that I don't use he or she, unless I'm referring to a particular person. But if I'm talking about a philosopher, it's philosophers, not he or she. So there's always a stake to the pronouns and hence the values and distinctions and therefore the entailment, stances, attitudes, and judgments that we make. So when we encounter someone now, we pass their language. We work it through very fast in our brains. And we think, what kind of engagements does this person have in the way they greet us, in the pronouns that they use, in the language that, they, that, that they're uh, using? None of that allows you to be quietist. In so doing, you're already carrying all the values uh, with you. Perhaps more importantly, I then go on to say in the text, we also do so by simply remaining silent. Silence is not an option. So one of the historical versions of quietism is a form of either religious silence or political silence. But in remaining silent, we already uh, engage uh, with the world, we are already constructing metaphysics, but we are doing so in a hidden manner. And that's what I want to unpick and try and unpick uh, in this talk. So I've been speaking for uh, an hour now. Uh, why don't I uh, break and take questions and then I can develop my argument a bit further uh, in taking the questions, if that's okay. Thank you very much, thank you. Um, I I think that Christian Frigerio can begin the discussion uh, with uh, some uh, questions and uh, Christian uh, is, comes from our department, right. is working uh, on uh, his uh, master thesis, <laughs> he's a Deleuze scholar and a Williams scholar, so please Christian. Yeah. Do you hear me? Yes, I do hear you well, thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, thank you, Mr. Williams, for uh, this exposition. I'd like to highlight uh, one point uh, which I think is interesting so that in case I'm making some sense, you can possibly elaborate on it uh, and then to ask uh, two questions. Then for the um, collective discussion, please uh, um, feel free to use the group chat uh, to ask questions. Uh, I, um, I will call your names progressively. We'll follow the rule from the last time given priority to the ones involved in the organization of these meetings, but I hope we can find time for, uh, for everybody. Sure. So, Mr. Williams, my uh, point relates to, uh, to Peirce. 
when he tried to differentiate himself from the uh, pragmatism that uh, William James was uh, making famous, Purse stressed that, the, let's say, he defined his uh, pragmatism, as he called it, as uh, a theory of uh, meaning rather than as uh, a theory of truth, as was uh, James' case. But uh, maybe more interestingly, I think uh, he, stressed, uh, he stressed the importance of uh, the modal element in uh, his definition. Pragmatism is uh, defined as uh, the doctrine the identifying the meaning of uh, an idea with the sum of the possible effects of the uh, conceivable effects of that idea would produce when uh, taken to be true. So that roughly we have a pragmatism of uh, possible of conceivable effects against James's practicalism, if uh, we may call it so, of uh, immediate effects. And it seems to me your fantastic pragmatism is much closer to uh, the first option to uh, Percy's uh, pragmatism with, however, an important difference that uh, while Percy's account was uh, um, merely descriptive, its aim was to clarify the meaning of ideas, uh, your fantastic pragmatism is, uh, in a sense, uh, um, normative. Pragmatism um, ought to be fantastic, but in fact, it uh, rarely is. So I think that uh, maybe you can uh, say something about that. Maybe, in your view, we may as well preserve uh, Percy's identification of uh, the meanings we uh, manipulate in our everyday lives with uh, the uh, range of their uh, possible effects, but this uh, descriptive, side, descriptive side should be coupled with uh, the, um, the ethical and uh, the political mission of widening, of enlarging the field of uh, the possible or of the uh, conceivable itself. Excellent, yeah. Okay, uh, fantastic questions, thank you. Um, so, I think that the, the first clarification or, 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 or distinction you say that that um, in that in some sense I'm closer to purse that's right uh, than 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 uh, than truth although um, uh, th there are interpreters of, of purse that bring purse back to a certain conception of truth right uh, in, in particular um, in relation to to the um, uh, third aspect of science so the for instance, um, uh, and that's what I, I want to uh, to draw a distinction with. So, so when we say conceivable effects, um, there's going to be a, a, a definition of what the conceivable means. And uh, conceivable, um, in the way that Peirce is using, uh, is going to involve... Um, uh, a relation to conceivable effects, right? You have to think of them now in terms of two. So, so how are they conceivable? And they're conceivable as effects. Uh, they're conceivable because, uh, for instance, in relation to the, the method of abduction, um, as being um, logically being able to thought, be thought of as conceivable effects, right? Now, uh, the, the difference with a fantastic uh, pragmatism is that what is going to stand as a conceivable effect is going to be a lot more broad in one sense. So there are going to be many more uh, conceptions of conceivable effects. So that's, that's uh, uh, one. Um, and uh, two, the relation between the... Um, let's say a, a statement um, and its effects um, is going to be um, itself much more fantastic potentially. Uh, so for instance, um, you said you work on Deleuze. Um, so, so here um, uh, Deleuze in his cinema books refers to Peirce, right? And um, and yet he goes much further than Peirce in terms of conceivable effects. Because the cinema that, that Deleuze describes shows an extraordinary inventiveness in terms of the conceivable effects from one given scene in the film to those that will follow. The whole point about great filmmakers as Deleuze uh, studies them is that um, they shock us 
in terms of conceivable effects. The whole point is that the effects aren't conceivable at all beforehand. So who would have thought that all the birds are going to suddenly start grouping together and attacking humans? Whoa, where did that come from? Was that a conceivable effect? No, right? Now, the, the step, the important step to go further, just to follow because, because of your interest in Deleuze, is that Deleuze's cinema books aren't about cinema. They're about realities. Deleuze isn't saying there is cinema that really stretches what conceivable effects are. Deleuze is saying reality is like cinema. And you can't think of conceivable effects in that kind of way. So, so yeah, I agree with you. Um, that, that I'm closer to the notion of conceivable effects, but I think that conceivable effects is always going to have to be wrapped in a metaphysics. So what Freud thought conceivable effects were going to be, and um, let's choose someone miles away from, um, uh, and Gilbert Ryle thought conceivable effects were going to be, would be, very, very distant, right? Uh, so, so that's the, the answer to, to the first question. Yes, conceivable effects, but conceivable effects have to be wrapped in a, a metaphysics and a whole account of creativity and so on. First answer. Uh, second, um, on the descriptive. Yes, uh, you're right. Um, the difference with Peirce uh, is uh, the descriptive I'm adding to it in relation to there's always going to be a speculative aspect, right? So uh, 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 agreed. Yes, you're right. The underlying uh, uh, reason for that is um, ethical political. That is, um, what, why would I be concerned in this? Well, it's for ethical uh, political reasons. But what arguments would I have? for moving away from the descriptive. And the arguments um, can be understood, um, for instance, um, in relation to um, the uh, contradictions and problems that um, social anthropology encounter. Um, in social anthropology, um, when you um, encounter um, other peoples, you are always going to be caught in a, um, a tension when you try to describe them because your descriptive um, modes are always going to be bringing in a certain set of cultural presuppositions. And that certain set of cultural presuppositions uh, are going to, to clash um, bend, um, inflect how you interact with uh, whatever you're observing. A very famous examples of this in terms of language. Uh, if you bring a language that cannot translate the 50 words for snow that another culture has, then your description is already breaking down. Now, one response to that could be, well, we just need to get better at describing, right? And I reject that. Uh, my view is that, no, we need to get better at describing, but the only way we can do that is by getting better at metaphysics and pragmatism. Does that start to answer your, your, your questions? I mean, uh, those are uh, terrific questions. Does that uh, address them? Um, now, as for my first question, since uh, you mentioned, mentioned uh, um, social anthropology, different groups, uh, if memory serves, uh, in uh, your draft, uh, you also mentioned uh, minorities. Uh, yeah. do, you do you think there is uh, um, a particular scale, uh, so to say, at which uh, fantasy or fancy comes in uh, during the uh, political process? I mean, um, Maybe today uh, some modes of thought are emerging that uh, would encourage us to uh, enlarge rather than to 
pluralize uh, and restrict the um, the scale to which the uh, the political uh, takes place. I think, for instance, of uh, the rise of uh, ecological thought. You mentioned uh, animals as uh, a philosophical theme, uh, theme, and also you stress the fact that uh, um, we never act uh, locally. Everything we do involves uh, the uh, the whole world. So uh, to say, so is there a, um, a scale uh, you think is uh, more immediately involved uh, in the uh, in the fantasy for of your uh, fantastic pragmatism and the identity of a fantastic uh, politics, so so to say. Right. So I'm going to an answer uh, that that question in two parts. So the, it's a great question again. The, um, the, the first part is uh, to say that the question itself uh, is an illustration of the pragmatism that I want to argue for. Because uh, you can see that there's already been the construction of a new concept, and a new concept is uh, the democracy to come. It's a concept that you find uh, both in Deleuze and Guattari and in Derrida and has been picked up by many other thinkers, that what we need is always a democracy to come, and that's therefore a minor, minor, minoritarian one. Why is it a minoritarian one? Because the democracy that we have is always for our current majority, uh, in, in some sense. So, so that's a great illustration, is, is that, that, that your question is a, is a pragmatic question in the sense that I want to defend, right, one. Um, two, um, what's my position um, in relation to an answer? Uh, and of course, it's not once and for all. It's uh, what, what would I speculatively, speculatively suggest now? And um, the answer is this. Um, in relation to the um, possibility of drawing out uh, minorities, it is um, more, it is uh, that we need to shrink the uh, democracies, but shrinking them doesn't mean necessarily shrinking them in terms of number. It means shrinking them in relation to the dominant values that those minorities are affected by, right? So uh, it's an argument for democracies that uh, address a particular um, wrongs and problems and do so in a way that um, an awareness, a democratic ear for those wrongs allows them to interact in ever bigger uh, structures. So first you need to, to go more uh, small and local in relation to a, a particular uh, wrong. So that's, that's democracy as a kind of listening. But then there's the question of democracy as a kind of um, system construction Having listened at a, at a um, I don't want to say local, you see, having listened along a particular line, according to a particular wrong, there is then a, a technical problem of how you feed that back in to continuing democracies. So, so that would be my, my answer uh, to that. So it's um, both shrink, or rather shrink, listen, expand, transform democracy that, that's the answer thank you and uh, uh, to conclude and then we can pass to the collective discussion uh, do you think there is something uh, intrinsic to pragmatism because of which uh, uh, pragmatism is often used as a, as a word even while downplaying some uh, important aspects in it i mean nowadays uh, pragmatism tends to be um, an edifying philosophy to use Rorty's term or a kind of uh, metaphysical chaotism, as you said, with uh, MacArthur downplaying the importance of the uh, metaphysical and constructive side that, as Rorty himself admitted, was uh, also present in uh, classical pragmatism. 
also you define the uh, pragmatism in, oppo in opposition to uh, common sense uh, well in fact uh, um, the importance of common sense was is a is a tenet of uh, uh, canonical uh, pragmatism so it's very reason why we want to talk about uh, um, adversian pragmatism or a Kantian pragmatism or Heidegger's or uh, Plato's pragmatism while uh, we wouldn't do the same for say structuralism uh, I think is it, yeah. is it only that uh, pragmatism can trace uh, no. is good at tracing flows uh, or is just an appealing word or no, no. for something more no no it's much stronger than that um uh, I've been I've been worrying about this as I wrote, wrote this um this short talk I've been worrying about it all the way through and I've been and I realized that uh, in writing the thing I was giving um sort of meta answers that pragmatism was a bridge between things and so on but that's not really a good answer to your question about its intrinsic aspect or and it's not a good answer in terms of what's uh, shared by the um uh, pragmatism that we encounter in the scolia of um Spinoza's uh, ethics, for instance, with its very strong pragmatism there, and and, and the answer that I've been um, I've been walking in the snow a lot because it's snowing in in Edinburgh, and uh, the, the 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 answer that I've been working on is is what's intrinsic to uh, pragmatism is that it's um, a philosophy of sensibility, right? um, and uh, I mean sensibility in the sense of being um particularly good at sensing how um a necessarily abstract system and structure conceptuality um value uh, set um interacts with worlds of experience so, so it's at that point that you have uh, pragmatism. So pragmatism, uh, what, what, what draws out the, the, the character, the intrinsic character of pragmatism is, is a, um, a many-fold sensibility. Um, and at its best, uh, it has tact. Now, tact, we often think of as something that we encounter in um, Victorian novels. Um, oh, don't speak to Mr. Darcy like that. Um, but I don't mean it in that sense. I mean, I mean tact as in um, an, an absence or, or a, a caution about, um, uh, uh, I don't want to use the word brutality because I, I hate the way it's associated with animals. Um, I mean a, a tact as a um, responsiveness. So, so, so uh, when I say what's intrinsic to pragmatism is sensibility, I mean a certain kind of responsiveness, an ability to um uh, uh absorb reflect and transform right so that's that's what's intrinsic to pragmatism thank you very much uh now i'll start the uh, the discussion so um as i said uh, um, i'll give priority to the ones uh, involved uh, in the organization uh, but uh, okay uh, so there is a question from uh, Enrico Monacelli. Yes, here I am. So okay. thank you, for Professor Williams, for the very interesting and, and engaging talk. Okay. Uh, I will start right away by saying that uh, my question is much more about the context rather than the content of your talk. Um, there has been an interesting turn in contemporary philosophy towards what uh, the cultural theorist Mark Fisher called the weird and the eerie. Uh, we've seen sort of uh, a lot of contemporary philosophy interested in these concepts of the strange, the weird, and the fantastic, uh, mm. in a sense. All of those things which are not common or um, which are outside of human understanding and human reach. And this has brought some interesting consequences. For example, the 
uh, reevaluation of the idea that uh, stories, even pulp stories, could have actual interesting philosophical ethics on reality rather than mm -hmm. being mere stories and yeah. relegated to a sort of secondary uh, and entertainment field. Um, and, and what I wanted to ask you very simply is uh, whether this sort of wider context of this new turn towards the weird has influenced your view on pragmatism. And if you think that pragmatism has uh, something to say to this new canon, which is building up this new weird canon. Um, wow, that's a, <laughs> it's, a, it's a great, it's an interesting question and a really good uh, for me because um, uh, there was a link in, in the talk and I removed it. And um, I, you'll have seen anybody who knows my blog knows that I have links all the way through uh, to literature and things. But um, the link uh, was to uh, a film. And this film is, is probably one of the most important films in terms of the um, of antecedents to uh, the weird and the eerie. It was a link to Buñuel's uh, Discreet Charm of the Bourgeoisie. And I linked to it uh, at the point when I was describing common sense and the ordinary. And the reason I, I wanted to link to it um, was that what Buñuel shows, what, what, what things that are described as weird and eerie show, is that underlying an apparently seamless, sensible bourgeois surface, there's all, always and already the weird and the eerie. Who, who would have thought um, that, it, that it would, uh, that under, under this surface, um, uh, it was there? Well, many people do. Uh, and, and, and those who do are often um, described as fantastic or science fiction writers. Um, but who do we turn to uh, now to think about our contemporary situation? Um, and who translated from the situation earlier and early developments to our situation now? Well, it's, it's writers like Philip K. Dick. Very, very important. Translating from um, work by, I don't know, Shannon in what, the late 1940s, um, right up to uh, now. We, we don't look at, at people who wrote um, ordinary stories. Uh, we, look, we look at these, these fantastic writers. So the answer is yes, but not because they are weird and eerie. It's yes, because we are weird and eerie. So, so that's the, the, the way I would, I would answer it, yeah. Thank you. Um... That's a lovely question. Okay, uh, Maria Regina Brioski. Uh, yes, so thank you very much. Um, I have a question um, just on your general, um, on your general view of this fantastic pragmatism, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, if I um, have understood correctly, um, pragmatism looking toward the future should be creative, mm -hmm. right? And so uh, to, to put forward a metaphysics, uh, but uh, not like a descriptive metaphysics, but more like a revisionary metaphysics, right? Mm -hmm. So, but uh, as you uh, said in some passages, of course, I, I mean, I, I see clearly your goal, but I see um, obstacles in the way, uh, standing in the way. So uh, how do you think uh, like um, it, it is possible to, to, to articulate uh, um, a fantastic pragmatism? So this kind of uh, revisionary metaphysics um, dealing with uh, language as we uh, must do, of course. So uh, I just want to understand better your proposal by, by see, I mean, uh, how can we um, go there? How can we really uh, formulate uh, 
a kind of such a prag fantastic pragmatism, creative pragmatism. Right. That's a, a really technical question. Um, so I'm going to um, I'm, I'm going to just try ideas right uh, to this. Um, but before I do that, the, uh, the, the underlying answer is, um, well, uh, the answer to that comes out of uh, an understanding of time. So um, it's a certain conception of uh, the, um, the philosophy of time um, and how that then interacts with what we understand um, uh, experience and the world to be it, the interaction between those that, that can then give us um, guidance as to to what it would be so start to answer one uh, select and transform the past so there's going to be a, a work of um, selection uh, so picking certain things from the past in relation to a problem and transforming them. Uh, you can already see that in relation to, to one of the um, answers or, or things that I discussed in, in, in the talk. Um, that's exactly what early pragmatism did in relation to selecting uh, certain aspects of Cartesianism, for instance, right? So uh, select and transform um, in the past. Um, two, uh, in the present, invent new concept in relation to ongoing series of concepts. So uh, for instance, you saw me do that in relation to a, a, an earlier question. Um, so what is pragmatism for you? Well, I, I, have, I had to, in the present, uh, reconfigure the concept pragmatism. So that's, that's another aspect. So, so there's a, a reconfiguring in, in the creation of a concept, but it's not um, uh, it's not ex nihilo, right? It's it it's always has to take what was there to 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 create the new. And then this fits in very well with the earlier question about the weird um, in relation to the future. There has to be an, a kind of responsibly irresponsible risk taking. What do I mean by that? Um, responsibly irresponsible risk taking. I mean that the fantastic pragmatism, the, the creativity, is going to have to take chances in terms of um, doing things very differently and therefore in inviting um, the future as something unknown, um, dangerous, um, risk-laden in. Um, th there's, there's frequently that aspect to any philosophy. So people always enormously underestimate just how irresponsible philosophers are the, when they, take chances with a, 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 new, uh, a new system or new structure. Uh, it's well known for some thinkers, um, people cite, I don't know, Nietzsche or Marx, or, but it's there in, in most philosophers, that kind of irresponsible risk-taking. Um, uh, possible worlds are real. Whoa. Okay, so, so in that sense, uh, there's a, a, a risk taking uh, in relation to the future uh, that is speculating and therefore inviting a, a, a new world that's, that's different. Um, and it's why philosophers are so um, 
influentially creative. It's not that, that Foucault uh, merely describes power, Foucault makes power and therefore invites a different, different world. So uh, those three aspects I think are very important. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. D does that give you a sense of what's going on? Yes, yes, uh, absolutely. Um, I was thinking, um, I was mm, made, I was making this comparison in my head um, with Whitehead and uh -huh. uh, with what he uh, the, did in process and reality, because that was a kind of like fantastic pragmatism or revisionary metaphysics in a way. So I was, um, I want to ask you uh, if I can just a little, a very small question more um, that is, is uh, the um, fantastic pragmatism you are thinking something like uh, what uh, Whitehead uh, did there. Yes. Uh, so he um, radically reinvents the language and the structure also. Uh, or is something more like uh, oriented toward action? So you mentioned before uh, the difference between the local and the global. So uh, it is this kind of uh, metaphysics and fantastic pragmatism more broadly, uh, something uh, which encompasses uh, like really actions or just more like um, a new thought. I mean, of course there is not this sharp difference between thought and action, but uh, I think, um, yeah, I hope it is. I have been clear. No, no, I, I, that, that, that's, that's exactly right. So uh, Whitehead is always in the background of, of what I'm doing. Um, so although um, I didn't mention him in, in, in the paper or talk, you'll see that in what I do in the past, there's lots of Whitehead. And um, uh, there's no, no question that uh, Whitehead is a fantastic pragmatism. Now, um, but it's a pragmatism in that sense that um, uh, at for the problems that Whitehead was working with, it had to be a fantastic pragmatism that um, uh, was highly inventive in terms of language, uh, extremely complex in relation to um, the sciences, um, was... Um, strongly systematic in a very traditional way, um, such that it can even be described as a new idealism or a new Platonism, right? Now, why was that? Well, Whitehead's sensibility, um, and this is his pragmatic sensibility, was towards the great changes that were taking place within uh, the sciences of his day. It was um, in uh, relation to the need for a very large scale new metaphysics that hadn't been done fully, i.e. one of process. Um, it was one that was a form of sensibility that was close to his own existential uh, uh, lives, his, his own um, uh, concerns. And he, he brought all those together in, in this extraordinary new system. So that's one fantastic pragmatism, but it's a pragmatism. It's the way he brought all those things together. Um, now, there could be another fantastic pragmatism um, with a... Uh, a political uh, say, uh, I'm trying to think of a, a, a good example of, of um... okay, I'll give you a bad example uh, of one that I was arguing against. Um, so when a, a group of political thinkers, almost at the same time, um, in the um, late 70s, early 80s, invented the, the concept of the third way, there was a, a pragmatism there, and and it 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 tried to be fantastic, but it failed. Uh, why? Because the concept that it chose was poorly put together, in my view. It was it was too common sense, too ordinary. Um, it thought that it 
that you could make a new concept and a new political position by simply going between two supposed extremes and and it 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 completely failed the test of time <laughs> okay so i'm going to really annoy people who like the third way but that what you're getting is my analysis of what went on now it, it, it so it's always going to be a matter of degrees and and then it's a matter of analyzing those degrees in relation to um the problem that uh, you, you yourself as a thinker uh have have um have been chosen by and have also chosen so that's that's how i would answer it but yes whitehead is yeah wow <laughs> uh extraordinary um pragmatism um and you, you can see it sorry you, you in relation to to whitehead you can see it um, what i like about whitehead is is the way in which not necessarily in in process and reality but but, but the way in which you can then draw between process reality and what, what he writes about education, what he writes about um, history, and so on. So, 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 so the um, anyone who thought that his uh, construction wasn't a pragmatism because it was too abstract or too fantastic doesn't understand how, in fact. It's also anchored in the worlds that he's interacting with. Thank you. I, I Thank think you. that there are many, many more questions also in the chat. Christian? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Rabiul Islam, do you want to uh, ask the question yourself? Or? Okay. Uh, thank you, Christian. So, my question is okay. Is the phrase common sense a formal like expression? For example, good morning or good evening only. Uh, J Mr. James, uh, am I clear on this question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, okay. Yeah, I want to hear more from you on this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. No, that 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 does draw out um, a particular uh, difficulty. So. Um, Yes, it's a formulaic expression, and we use it in a formulaic way. Um, now, so that's one uh, part of the answer. Uh, two, it's also a philosophical um, expression that you, you find in, in Kant and, and, and uh, among the, um, uh, well, well, Reed and, and so on and so forth. Um, so it's both. Uh, now, uh, does that matter? Um, yes, it does. And that's, this is why the question is important. I want to claim that formulaic expressions are particularly dangerous um, as uh, carrying the um, latent metaphysics that I uh, want to um, to criticize and avoid. Uh, and uh, a good way of uh, explaining that is the role of an appeal to common sense as a formulaic expression uh, within um, debates in the Westminster Parliament. So in, in Parliament, um, you frequently find the, the, the formulaic expression common sense. And, and so uh, they say, um, uh, well, it's common sense that we shouldn't spend more than we own, that, than we earn, right? But of course, underlying that use of common sense is a particular account of economics that's completely false in relation to a state. So, uh, what appeared to be a form formulaic expression, yeah, it's common sense. Yeah, you can't spend what you haven't earned. Actually, is carrying a very uh, extensive and wrong economic uh, aspects. So, so yeah, now that's a, a very important technical uh, 
refinement. Uh, it, it, it's both. It, it's a formulaic expression, uh, but it's also a philosophical expression, and both of them are metaphysical. Thank you so much. Thank you for the question. Uh, Raymond Davidson had posed a, had asked a question uh, during your exposition. I don't know if he's still online, but uh, uh, I think that may interest us as well. He asked uh, uh, if there is a definition of metaphysics uh, you are uh, working with. Can you say that again? I didn't catch that. Sorry, uh, is there a definition of metaphysics uh, we are working with? Yes. Um, so the, the the definition of metaphysics, I think there's one actually in the in the paper, uh, in the in the blog post, um, and it, it, it what's important about uh, metaphysics is it's it, the construction of of uh, structures and systems that are 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 in process. So we we can think of metaphysics and and um, in particular within the analytic tradition, um, for instance, uh, questions about whether something is real is a metaphysical question. Okay, now that's not what I mean by metaphysics. Um, metaphysics is the proposal of a model of the world. That's that's what a a, a metaphysics uh, would do. So, um, and therefore. Uh, when, when Descartes um, proves the existence of God, um, uh, you could say, well, that's, he's doing metaphysics because he's proving the existence of, of something. That's not Descartes' metaphysics. Descartes' metaphysics is um, the dualism, the role of um, deductions within that, uh, the uh, mechanism um, uh, underlying matter. Uh, it's the um, defense of uh, criteria of clarity and distinctness and wanting to bring them into um, a set of rules for reasoning. When you bring all those together, that's when you get Descartes' metaphysics, right? So that's the, the answer. Um, so you'll see um, that, that in, in, even in the short piece that I, I wrote, you, you'll see that the definition of metaphysics sort of grows and is a bit messy. Um, uh, but um, as the French say, j'assume, um, I, I admit to that messiness. Okay, and uh, um, Alexander Fyodorov? Yep, hello there. Uh, thanks for the great dis discussion. I think that after all the words were said, my question is a little bit of redundant, but still I would uh, I would care for a comment from, yeah. from you. Uh, considering your stress on the creative, constructive, and the inventive as a whole, how do you see your idea of fantastic pragmatism in uh, relation to similar pro projects or what I see as similar projects? with a similar attitude of philosophizing. And what I have in mind is uh, Cornel West's prophetic pragmatism, which has been yeah. around for at least 30 years, yeah. or uh, Roberto Unger's more recent idea of radicalized pragmatism. Yeah. And if you would allow me just a little bit of a provocation here, yeah, yeah. Do we yeah. need to still label all those ideas, fantastic pragmatism, prophetic pragmatism, and radicalized pragmatism, pragmatism? Because they're so different from the original, and this is a provocation from a Peirce scholar, yeah. because I always yeah. see in my mind how Peirce goes crazy when he reads other pragmatists. Yeah. So thanks. <laughs> this is what philosophers do. Um, the um let's let's work work through it um in terms of the prophetic i think i think absolutely right so um there's a um a strong connection uh to uh in, in the notion of prophetic to what i said about the relation to the future uh in terms of uh an earlier answer about how uh, one would be um, 
construct uh, in a uh, fantastic way. So uh, in that sense, um, yes, uh, Cornell West prophetic pragmatism um, would fit in. Um, for Unger, I'm, I'm not so sure. I just, uh, I don't have the competence to answer that uh, in relation to, to, to Unger. So I'd have to do more research and, and, and work on that. Um, but let's, I'm not claiming that I'm doing anything particularly new, right? Um, uh, what I'm trying to do is, as I said at the start of the talk, um, uh, relate uh, a set of historical concerns, um, mainly in post-structuralism, but in other branches of philosophy. And um, what I am doing that's new, uh, which is a, a process philosophy of science, and then a certain account of the sublime, and then whatever I do next. Um, so, so that's the, the answer. But I, the prophetic is really, is really nice. That's a, a really important point, because you know when I talk about a, talked about a democracy to come, well, that that would fit in to that notion of of a prophetic um, pragmatism, and and um, the two thinkers who use that expression, democracy to come, uh, also insist on that prophetic aspect. In particular, uh, Derrida and, for example, Spectres of Marx. So, so yeah, uh, is the um, simple answer. Now, I, I like your provocation, and um, uh, does it matter that it's still called pragmatism? Yes, it does. Uh, and it does because of the um, special, special and precise things that we can say by referring back to uh, pragmatism. For instance, uh, you'll have seen the number of times that I talked about um, experience. I also talked about uh, evidence uh, in relation to Whitehead, you could say bumping up against the world. What, um, even if uh, there isn't a single short definition of pragmatism that applies to all pragmatists, what the term pragmatism allows us to do is make it more and be more accurate um, and also deeper in terms of uh, how we think about a particular practice. So, uh, and I prefer that to, uh, and I said this right at the start of the talk, I prefer that than thinking that labels are exclusive, right? That pragmatism somehow belongs to um, purse or that um, somehow um, uh, the um, a certain kind of method only belongs to Spinoza or that um, skepticism should only belong to uh, Socrates and, and so on and so forth. Um, so, so that's sometimes the looseness of words is a good thing so long as we also understand that that looseness allows for a richness and productivity of those words. Thanks a lot. No, thank you. Thank you for the question. Is there uh, anybody else? Maybe if there is, I, I can wait if there is something, someone else. Uh, otherwise, um, I have. No, no, not in the chat. It's not a question, a note. I don't think there is uh, anybody else for now. Yeah, exactly. I thank you. It was a really a wonderful, a fantastic lecture. Thank you. Uh, in the first part, uh, I listened to my purse, <laughs> in fact, because when uh, you talk about uh, a process of philosophy, I heard uh, the synechistic uh, uh, philosophy of purse, mm -hmm. the theory 
of continuity. Peirce uh, uh, wrote that uh, being is just a matter of degree, of more or less. It's not uh, being uh, opposite to not, not being. Mm. And uh, I, I, there is the echo of this in, in your presentation, I think. Mm. Um, secondly, the metaphysical conception, uh, I think that also in this sense, uh, there is uh, something Persian and something uh, that maybe goes uh, away from Perse, uh, off, far away from Perse, because uh, Perse uh, uh, wrote again <laughs> that uh, um, there can be a scientific metaphysic. Mm -hmm. Scientific in two senses, that uh, uh, there is a, a, a semiotic metaphysics because metaphysics uh, deals with words and words are signs. So when we uh, speak of uh, being, we are always speak, uh, speaking of uh, uh, of a word or a sign. And uh, metaphysics can be pragmatic. And uh, about the last word uh, you said, I think that this is important. Uh, pragmatic because um, metaphysics uh, is to be measured uh, beginning uh, from uh, its practical effects. So what is being? Uh, the right question is not what is being, but uh, what uh, can do the world, the practice of believing in being? Mm -hmm. I don't know if you <laughs> see in this way, maybe there is a distance from uh, no, that's, uh... your, your reading and purses, but I, I hear also so many uh, similarities. Yes, now that's lovely and um, extremely helpful too. Um, I, I I agree, right? So um, in in the way you have drawn those aspects out of purse, um, there there is um, a, a, a strong overlaps and uh, connections. And, and what's interesting is, is that um, uh, Peirce can be taken in, in so many different directions and taking Peirce in, in this direction, just, just the direction that you've just given, um, does bring Peirce very close to, um, in particular in relation to, to words and signs, close to, to, to what, what I want to say. So in some sense, um, and I've, I've written about Peirce a little in the past and so on, in some sense, the way in which uh, Peirce uh, is, uh, is different uh, from the position that I want to, uh, to defend is when um, uh, specific aspects of Peirce's um, uh, method and definitions are given. So for instance, um, uh, Peirce's account of a sign is different from the account of the sign that, that I would want to give, even though um, the, the, the words are signs and the importance of a semiotic um, is, in, is, is so consistent, beautifully consistent between uh, Deleuze and Peirce. So there, Deleuze and Peirce uh, are... are, um, are together um but uh wow it's a really difficult question because it, it it comes then down to to a matter of interpretations in relation to for instance um, whether there's a hierarchy in in um the way in which purse describes the sign whether uh, some as aspects of the sign are are more or less important whether how they interact and interfere with one another. So it would, 
there's a beautiful book to be written on Deleuze and Peirce. I don't, I don't know, has, has one been written? I'm not sure, but um, that would be fascinating. Where I think there might be a difference is in this. Um, Deleuze's conceptual frameworks tend to, to view the system as being open to being um, almost completely transformed and changed. And so uh, un underlying um, any, any structure is a sort of um, creative chaos. Now, would, would that, would you, do you think that would, would be consistent with Peirce? Maybe not. So, uh, anybody else? No. So, um, if we are to conclude, just as a reminder, uh, next meeting will be on uh, the 3rd of uh, March. We'll have uh, Colin Koopman from the University of Oregon, and uh, the theme of uh, the meeting will be an analytics of conduct toward actionist uh, pragmatism. As a discussant, we'll have uh, uh, Sarin Marchetti from the um, Università degli Studi di Roma La Sapienza. I don't know if uh, there is uh, anybody else who wants to ask uh, something. I think we were supposed to uh, stop at six. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, we are on time. Maybe just we can wait a moment because I think that Rosella has some problem of connection. Yeah, yeah I think so. And I'm sure that she wants to yeah. say a few words as concluding remarks. Um, Well, while we're waiting, I, I would like to thank everybody for the questions. Um, it's always better for the person giving the talk to get the questions, I think, than for than give the talk because it uh, it allows me to think about what I've done and and how I'll change it. So uh, thank you very much for the questions. They're enormously helpful for me. Thank you. Um, so Rostella. <clears throat> Meanwhile, maybe I can ask another question uh, if you are waiting for Rosella. Um, uh, it's also a sort of provocation. Uh, that, don't you think that uh, also the notion of creation have, uh, in a way, some uh, metaphysical presupposition? Yeah. Because uh, we think, uh, as, as normally, as creation as a process uh, of uh, volition, deliberated will, and so yeah. I, yeah. I want to ask if it's possible, um, and uh, I think particularly about Deleuze, to give a retomantization of uh, the notion of volition in uh, of creation in a non-anthropocentric uh, way. Yeah, no, absolutely. So yes, you're right. Um, any word has metaphysical um, uh, connotations, and but you're right that creation has ones that, that are potentially particularly problematic in terms of, of what I want to do. And you're also right that um, uh, among the most problematic for creation is volition. The, the other really problematic one is um, the notion of uh, creation um, coming from the outside and coming from a greater power. Uh, terrible uh, presuppositions that I wouldn't want. Um, so, so yeah, there'd have to be uh, an effort to um, transform those. Um, so the the, the challenge uh, coming after De, after Deleuze and, and and his work is is to give an account of creativity where um, any activity um, it, it takes place um, on on the surface and in response to a passivity. So. Uh, if I, if I, well, I have had to uh, elsewhere um, describe this, um, uh, volition um, is always illusory if it gives the 
impression of um, independence. Uh, volition is really a secondary account of a um, uh, passivity, activity, um, interaction, or, or fold, to use a Deleuzean concept, right? Um, and so you, you're completely right in using the term uh, creation. Um, I'm using creation in a um, post volition and um, definitely post genius and that sort of concept uh, manner, right? So, so yeah, that's important. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, okay, so Rosella has still some problems with her laptop. So uh, I want to just um, thank you again, James, also thank you. on behalf of Rosella. And thank you all for um, taking part in the discussion. And I see you, I hope to see you then, to see you all on the 3rd of March. And so again, um, thank you to all and um, have a good evening. Yes, you too. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.